Today we are bringing our Time of Your Life message series to a close. Uh, we've been looking at this one topic for, for quite a while now, the topic of time and, and what we should be doing with our time, how we use our time, how we waste our time. And uh, I've enjoyed going through this. I hope you have too. I hope you feel like it's been worth your time to come and sit here and listen to these messages. Um, and I hope that you've been encouraged by them and challenged by them. And so as we bring this series to a close, I wanted to recap some of the things that we've talked about so far. So if you would take a look at the back of your bulletin, there's a little recap of this whole series here. And I tried to boil down each one of the, the, the sermons that we've, we've done so far down to one sentence, down to one line. And so if you've been here for all five of them, um, that you, you hopefully you'll remember some of these things. Uh, week one, we talked about, uh, really we talked about our theme verse from Psalm 90 verse 12, which is teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Uh, this is something that Moses said. This is something uh, that Moses prayed for on behalf of himself, on behalf of his people, and this is something that we can also pray and should also pray to God. God, give us an awareness that our days are numbered. And so that first sermon, that's what that was all about, living with an awareness that our days are numbered, knowing that we don't have an endless supply of time. Whenever we think we have more of something than we actually do, we tend to waste it. And so our prayer is simply this, God, remind us that we only have so much time here on this earth. The second sermon we did was, uh, if you were here, you remember the, uh, the snowballs and the little tiny stones. Do you remember that one? And we talked about priorities on that day and how we need to put the important stuff in first, spend time on the important stuff first. So whatever those priorities are in our lives, we need to spend time with those things. Then we can add in the fun stuff. Then we can add in Facebook and YouTube and all that stuff after we've taken care of business, after we've done the important stuff. Then in the third week, we talked about the fact that there is a cumulative value to investing small amounts of time in certain activities. Okay? That message wasn't supposed to be about working out and exercise, but I think it became that. <laughs> Several of you came to me in the following week and said, you know what, I'm exercising now. I woke up early and I'm doing, oh, all right, you got that out of it. But that was really just based on this idea that there's a cumulative value. Certain things we do, like exercise or like studying a new language or learning an instrument, you make small investments of time on a regular basis, and there's a cumulative value to that. Maybe there's not a whole lot of value in any one session, but there's a cumulative value in doing certain things. And, and one of those things is certainly spending time with God every day, spending time to pray, spending time in His Word. Tiny bit of value right there in the moment, but there's a larger cumulative value if you make a habit of doing these things. Last week, we talked about the fact that we should dedicate more time to our strengths, invest into our strengths, and not spend too much time on our weaknesses. And that's a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, we tend to, to really focus on the things that we're not good at and try to lift ourselves up and make ourselves better in that area. Or really, it, it makes more sense to, to focus on our strengths, what we do well, because our strength and weaknesses will never be as strong as our strengths, if that makes sense. So God has given us all strengths, gifts, talents, whatever you want to call it. And so we should really focus on our time on putting those talents, putting those strengths to good use. And then today, not to give too much away in advance, but today we're focusing on this, this last point here of finding meaning beyond the sun. And hopefully by the time we're finished this mes message, that will make some sense to you. Well, um, the weather's been getting warmer. I hope that, that you're enjoying that. We've had a, a long and brutal and snowy winter, so I'm certainly glad to see spring here. And I uh, was out in the backyard a couple weeks ago, the first warm day we had, the first glimpse of spring that we had, and I'm taking a look at our back deck. It's a wooden deck, and I realized that it needs some work done on it. It needs to be restained. I need to replace a few boards. And I was thinking back to the very first time, uh, our very first summer in that home, uh, when I f stained the deck and did all that work. Um, that's not the kind of work that I enjoy. Some people really love that, being able to get out there and you know, get the power washer out and scrape down all the old you know, paint or stain and then go through and paint all the individual strips of lattice, restain everything, and then do your second coat. And I couldn't stand doing it. Um, I liked it being done. I wanted it to be done. I didn't want to do the work. And so my first time doing it, I thought, well, this isn't going to be too tough. And then it's like, okay, this is taking an entire weekend, and then it's taking a second weekend, and a little bit of a third weekend. So I underestimated how much time it was going to take to do this project, but when it was done, it was done. It looked better, okay? I'm not great at that kind of work, but it looked better. There was an improvement. And I made a vow to myself right then and there that I was never going to do that again. <laughs> the next time it needed to be done, I was going to pay somebody to do it. So a few years later, as I'm restaining the deck, um, I remembered that vow that I made and why I made it, because it's really tough work. It's time consuming, and I don't know, enjoy doing it, and I'm not great at it, but I did it that second time, and it was done. And now I look out back, and I'm like, I cannot believe this needs to be done 
again. And I was overwhelmed with this sense of the futility of it all. I've already done this. I've already poured out, I don't know how many weekends into maintaining this thing. And it just started to feel futile and, and meaningless. Why am I doing this? Did you ever get a sense of that futility of some of the things that we do in life, right? You know, I'm there washing the dishes and why am I doing this? They're just going to get dirty again. You go to the grocery store and Bob, people are just going to eat this food and I'll be back here next week. You're cutting the grass, I'm just going to have to do it again next week. I mean, there are these things that happen. You're out there raking the leaves. It's not like that's going to be the last time you rake the leaves. There are things that we just keep doing. And, and sometimes, have you ever experienced that? That sense of futility. Why am I doing this? What's the purpose behind it? Well, it just so happens that there is a book in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that speaks to this kind of thing. The futility of some of these activities we engage in in this world. Except this book, Ecclesiastes, it really dives much, much, much deeper into the issue. And so I'd like for you, if you have your Bible with you today, please turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. It's towards the middle of your Bible. It's uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Right, Lauren? Did I get that right? Okay. Ecclesiastes is right towards the middle there. And just to give you some some information on what this book is, uh, this was something written by Solomon. Solomon was the king over Israel at a point in history when um, Israel was the superpower of the world. And Solomon, other than Jesus, Solomon was the wisest person who ever lived. Okay? And Jesus even credits him with that. He was the wisest person who lived. And people from all over the world would travel and, and, and seek him out and ask him questions because of his great wisdom. And so he was the wisest person who has ever lived, and he was the, the king over Israel when they were a superpower. He was wealthier than you will ever be. He was more powerful than you or I will ever be. He had more wisdom than we will ever have. And he enjoyed being king over Israel at a point in history where there was peace. He had peace on all of his borders. And so he had time. He had time to think, to ponder, to meditate, to pray, and to really focus on answering some of the big questions that people have. And so Solomon sat down and dedicated his his mind and his spirit and his thought process to answering the biggest question. What's the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? And I believe the book of Ecclesiastes, it's more than this, but it is an answer to that question. What is the meaning of life? And so, Josh Peterkin read a a passage from Ecclesiastes this morning, and uh, Josh began with chapter 1, verse 3, but I want to back it up to verse 1 so you can hear what that has to say, okay? Here we go. Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verse 1. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. That's Solomon. Meaningless. Meaningless. Exclamation point. Meaningless! Exclamation point. Says the teacher. Utterly meaningless! Exclamation point. Everything is meaningless. All right. I think we're done here. Uh, Thanks for coming. I'll see you next Sunday. (laughs) Wow! How did this book make it into the Bible? That's not exactly uplifting, is it? All right? And what Solomon's doing here, it's basically like when you had to, you know, write your term papers or your essays or whatever it is in in high school and college, and you had to start out with your thesis statement. And so that's what this is. Solomon's saying, hey, if you don't get to the rest of it, let me make my point right up front, meaningless. You're asking me what the meaning of life is? Meaningless. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now that needs some explanation. And if you've never read the book of Ecclesiastes, I almost want to tell you, well, don't. Don't start it unless you're going to finish it, okay? Because what Solomon is doing here, he's kind of luring us in. He's he's, he's piquing our interest. And that's supposed to be somewhat of a a, a controversial statement. We're supposed to say, wait a minute, Solomon, what do you mean by that? And then read more, okay? So if you're going to start this book, you owe it to yourself to finish it. And as you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you will find a certain phrase throughout the book. And it's this phrase, under the sun. Under the sun. And when you see that phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes, what Solomon is referring to, life here, 
in this world, on the earth, under the sun. And what Solomon is saying is, if this is all there is, what's under the sun, your few years here on this planet, if that's all there is to existence, then there is this sense of things being meaningless. And just go through the book as if, you know, those first few statements weren't enough. You go through and he, he lists all the things that are meaningless. He says, well, pleasure is meaningless. Folly is meaningless. Wisdom is meaningless. Uh, wealth, working hard and toiling, that's me. And like, oh, are you kidding me? This is supposed to be important stuff. This is the stuff that we live for. But again, he's talking about things under the sun. If that's all there is, then there's this sense of, of things being meaningless. Meaningless. <sighs> Utterly meaningless. Do you ever get a glimpse into that in your life? Like what we talked about earlier, some of the work that we do, and it's just like, this will never be done. And what Josh read for us about how, you know, the, the streams all float into the river or, or into the ocean, but the ocean is never full and your eyes never have enough of seeing. There's never like, okay, that's done. It's just this sense of futility, this sense of, of meaninglessness. And for those of you who are young, you, you may be like shocked by hearing all this. But once you get to be about, I think, maybe 50 or beyond, once you've like gone through school and started work and done all this stuff, you start to really see what Solomon is talking about, right? There's this sense of, why am I doing all this, okay? And he does talk a bit about wealth and talk about you no know, gain and, and all these things, things that we pursue. And he says it's like, it's like chasing after the wind, right? Not too long ago, I think Kelby mentioned the, the sin of greed. Didn't you talk about greed a little bit in that sermon series? And, and how it's not like you're ever like going to say, okay, I've got enough money now. If that's what you're pursuing, it kind of never, it never stops. It's like, well, what's the point of all that? And Solomon tells us, thing is, he says, you know, if, if you're pursuing some of these things, if you're pursuing material possessions and wealth and all that, well, what happens when you get all the stuff? What happens next? Well, then you die. <laughs> And somebody else gets all the stuff, right? Now, it's important not to misunderstand what Solomon is saying, or we could all be very, very depressed over this book. But again, Solomon is talking about finding meaning strictly here on this earth, strictly here, you know, in the bookends of your life on this planet, how there is this futility to it all. I want to skip ahead. I think you want me to skip ahead, too, to some good news, all right? So I want to skip ahead to the end of the book so you can see where Solomon brings all of this. Chapter 12, verse 13. And so he has spent this entire book, all these chapters really making this point, looking at the futility of, of life here under the sun. And now here's what he has to say, verse 13. He says, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Verse 14, for God will br bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. As you're reading through the book of Ecclesiastes, you'll also see that Solomon talks about the fact that sometimes there's just this lack of justice in the world, right? Right? When you were growing up, how many people told you, well, life's not fair? When you complained about whatever your brother or sister had and you didn't give it, well, life's not fair. Life's not always fair. Life's not fair. Have you heard that? You've heard that, right? Somebody told you that when you were growing up. And Solomon talks about that issue. You know, he talks about the fact that he sees people doing all the right things and they're making the good decisions, they're making the right choices, and then tragedy befalls them. He says, what is that? That's not right. But that's the kind of thing that happens under the sun in this broken world of ours. And so at the end of this book, he tells us, and he, he really speaks to that issue in verse 14. He says, you know, maybe here, yeah, definitely here, there is injustice. There's this sense of why did this happen? Why do, you know, bad things happen to good people? Why, you know, why do the, do the wicked, why do they gain? And why do the righteous seem to fall sometimes? It doesn't seem right. So, well, that's just how it is in this broken world under the sun. But there will be a time where God's justice prevails. And he knows every good deed. He knows every wicked deed. And, and he'll make sense of it all. He'll make things right. And before, before that, verse 13, what is Solomon telling us there? He's saying, well, there's a lot of things you can pursue in life. 
There's a lot of things that you can chase after. There's a lot of ways that you can use your time. There's a lot of ways that you can spend the time that you've been given here on this planet. But what's the only thing that's worth doing? What's the one thing that we should be about? How should we be using our time? This is what the whole series is about, time. What should we, how should we be filling our days? What should we be doing? What's worth doing? That's really the question here. What is worth doing? That's the question I have for Solomon when I read this book. You're telling me this is meaningless. You're telling me that is meaningless. You're telling me everything that I grew up believing was important. You're telling me it's meaningless. Then what's worth doing with my time? And Solomon's answer is simple. Fear God. Keep his commandments. That's worth doing. That's worth doing because there is an eternal value. There's value beyond the sun in doing these things. Let's talk a little bit about fearing God. We don't like that, do we? You ever come across that phrase when you're reading scripture? Fear God. Fear God. It's like, well, no, God is a God of love and we're not supposed to fear him because he loves us and he's kind to us and he's compassionate. Yes, he does love us. Absolutely. That's his defining attribute or quality or whatever you want to call it. God is love. He does love us. Absolutely. And he is compassionate to us, towards us. He's quick to forgive. Absolutely. But we're being told to fear God. Now, some people want to say, well, that's, you know, it just means like respect God. Okay, yes. We are to respect God. We are to revere him. Okay, yes. But it's more than that. Because God is all-powerful and you are are not. <laughs> you knew that already, right? God is God and you are not. He has this power. Yes, we should be in all of it. We should be amazed by it. But when you really come face to face with the glory of God, his power, his might, his ability, there's a healthy fear that should kick in there. Whoa! Just knowing what God can do and, and I'm powerless to stop it. There's a fear in that, a good, healthy fear. Not like the fear of the, of the boogeyman or something like that, but a healthy, respect-based, reverent fear of God. I want to keep his commandments because he's got all the power. I have none. I know he loves me. I'm going to serve him out of my love for him. But I know he is worthy of my fear. He's worthy of your love. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy of your fear. Solomon says that's, that's what you got to do. Fear God and keep his commandments. So that's, that's what we need to do with our time. Fear God, keep his commandments. What are his commandments? <laughs> what does he want from, you know, I mean, commandments, we read that word in scripture, like, okay, that's a Bible word, commandments, whatever. Uh, let's put it this way. Fear God and do what he has told you to do. Fear God and do the things, you know, those of you who are Christians in this room, fear God and do the things that Jesus has told you to do. Do the things that Jesus commanded his disciples to do. Fear God, respect him, have reverence for him, be in all of his power, and do the things he's told us to do. What has he told us to do? What, is Jesus, what has he told us to do? Well, if you read the Gospels, and if you really focus on the, the end of Matthew, I mean, Jesus does tell us quite simply what we are to do. We, those of us who are followers of Jesus, we are to go into the world and make disciples. What does that mean? <laughs> What does it mean to make a disciple? Now, we spent some time talking about that not too long ago, so I don't want to re-preach that whole sermon. But this whole thing of making disciples, it starts with sharing Jesus with someone else. Sharing Jesus. We share Jesus. We share Jesus by, you know, inviting people to church. We share Jesus by, uh, by spending time with people who are in need, by serving those who are in need, by, um, by inviting other people to see and taste and touch and hear the gospel message. And the gospel message is this. There is salvation in Jesus Christ. God sent his one and only son into this world. His name is Jesus. He died on the cross in my place and in your place. And everyone who puts their trust in him will receive eternal life. That's the gospel message. And this is the thing that we are called to do. Making disciples, it's sharing that message. Sharing it in word and in deed. Explaining it with our words and uh, incarnating this message with our deeds. That's what we've been com commanded to do. And so for those of you who are, who are, you know, maybe hearing some of these verses for the first time and looking at this book of Ecclesiastes for the first time and say, whoa, this is kind of shocking. It is kind of shocking. But it's something that deep inside of you, you already know it's true. If all there is is this life under the sun, then, then what's the point? Okay, 
we have this thing, um, you know, here in our culture. It's not just here in America, but it's definitely here. Um, where we are told to pursue certain things. We're encouraged to pursue certain things. In fact, there's this thing we have called the American dream, right? What's the American dream? Well, you grow up and you work hard, you do well in school, and then you stand on the shoulders of your parents or wherever they got in life, you get the next step and you go to college and you get you know, good grades and you get a good job and you make good money, you buy a bigger house than your parents could afford and you buy the stuff and then you can retire and you can stand on the roof with your American flag and say, I did it. I've done it. The American dream is mine. I've succeeded. Then what? <laughs> Retirement. Then what? Golf. I don't know. <laughs> Vacation. Okay, that sounds great. That sounds great. Then what? Death. Then what? Somebody else gets all the stuff. <laughs> right? And you know that already. If all there is is what's here under the sun, there is a meaningless, I mean, it is, it's futile, it's meaningless. What's the point of all that? Why have I been pursuing this thing, this American dream or whatever you want to call it? I, pr I pursued it and I succeeded. What was the point of that? Now what? Now what? Don't give in to that. I don't have anything, I mean, I'm an American, by the way. Um, I consider myself patriotic. I'm not trying to bash America or anything like that. I'm just saying, don't buy into the fact that that's all there is. Don't pursue that kind of thing above all else because there is a meaninglessness to it. Over the past um, 10, 12, 15 years, I've had um, lots of opportunities to talk with young adults, with teenagers who are graduating high school and thinking about colleges and, and, and with uh, you know, young adults who are preparing to graduate college and what are they going to do next and now it's time to get a job and you know, what am I going to do? And um, I share the same piece of advice with anybody going through that stage of life. The what's next? What should I do? What should I study in school? What should I major in? What am I going to do? And I say, well, wait a minute. Think about it from the perspective of eternity. Now, we're all taught we've got to think about a career, think about what kind of money you make, where you want to live, all this stuff. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Think about what God wants you to do. Or to put it in other words, think about why has God put you on this earth? Start there. Then you can think, you can work your way backwards from there. Then you can think about career. Then you can think about where you're going to live. Then you can think about college. Then you can think about these other things. Fill in the details, but start with God. Why has God put you here? What does he want you to do? Start there. And that always comes as a, as a surprise to the young people that I talk to. It's like, oh, I never thought of that. I was thinking more about career. I was thinking more about what kind of money I want to make. I was thinking more about what kind of work I want to do. Whoa, start with God. Think about what ha why has he put you here on this planet? Because if the Bible is true, God has put each one of us here on this planet for a specific reason. He's given each one of us a purpose. And the purpose that God has given you, it ties directly into God's mission on this earth. Now God, the thing that he wants most, let's start with that question. We talked about that not long, too long ago. The thing that God wants more than anything else is to rescue his children, his people, humankind. That's what God wants. That's the mission that God is on in this earth. And he has given each one of you talents, strengths, gifts. He's given each one of you a purpose that ties directly into what God wants. Does that make sense? The reason that God has put you here on the planet ties directly in to his mission and what he wants. And so the question I encourage you to ask yourself, and this is for those of you who are young, this is for those of you who are, who are in retirement or looking at retirement or whatever, wherever stage of life you're in, whatever stage of life you are in right now, you can ask this question, God, what do you want? Now we know the general answer. God wants to rescue his children. So the specific answer becomes, what do you want from me, God? Why have you put me here on this planet? What do you want me to do? I really encourage you and challenge you to ask that question. Maybe you already have. Maybe you already know. Maybe you don't know. Ask God that question. Why have you put me here? I believe I'm here for a reason. I believe that you've put me here on purpose. What's the purpose? Ask God that question. I spent several years of my life asking God that question. And along the way, I arrived at some wrong conclusions. I made some mistakes. I didn't quite figure out what God wanted. But then, ultimately, I think at least for now, I think I know what God wants me to do. I think I know how I play into God's overall plan and God's mission. And so I'd ask you to take the time and really pursue that. And here's what you'll discover when you find the answer. 
that you can't do it on your own. <laughs> whatever purpose God has given you, whatever, whatever meaning there is in your life, whatever thing God has called you to do, you're not going to be able to do it on your own. You're going to need God, you're going to need his Holy Spirit, and you're going to need the church. You're going to need other people. Now, the thing that God has put me on this earth to do, I cannot do in a vacuum. I can't do it in a void. I need to be connected not only to God, but to his church. And if you really seek the answer to that question for yourself, why am I here? Why am I on this planet? Why have you put me here? When you find that answer, you're going to discover you need God. You need a connection to God. You need his power, his might, his strength. And you need to be connected with a local body of believers. There's no way around it. You cannot fulfill your God-given purpose in a vacuum. You can't. All right, we've got all kinds, just on a Sunday morning. Now, now, church is beyond Sunday mornings. You know this, right? But just let's take Sunday morning, for example. You've got people doing all kinds of things. You've got somebody working the camera. He can't do that in a vacuum, can he? All by himself. Unless there's other things going on. We've got people handing out bulletins. We have people working with the kids. It's like we need to all do this together. I can't just stand up here and, you know, sit by myself in the theater and do what I do. We all have different things. And like I said, that's just talking about Sunday morning. That's a little tiny percentage of your life, a little tiny percentage of your week. Then we leave this place. We need the church. We support one another. We complete one another. Scripture talks about the church as a body. And all of us are pieces of the body. Somebody's a thumb. A thumb on its own, what's that going to do? Nothing. Somebody's a foot. Somebody's a leg. Somebody's a whatever, okay? And I'm not going to tell you what you are because that would be weird. But we all need to come together to make one body with Jesus Christ as the head. Kind of a weird picture, but it's perfect. A perfect representation of what it means to be the church. And so as you think about how to use your time, how to spend your time here on this earth, don't settle for something that's, that's just limited to, to life under the sun. Don't pursue things that are just here under the sun. Find your purpose. Find your meaning beyond the sun. Find your meaning and your purpose in God. Ask him the question, why have you put me here? Seek the answer, and you will find it over time. Let's not settle for life just under the sun. Let's pursue something greater, and we can do this together. Remember, you are not on your own, okay? God does not just call people out as individuals and go do this random thing all by yourself. No, he's created a collective called the church. We are in this together. Seek the answer to that question. Really do. I'm, I'm putting it out there. I'm throwing down the gauntlet. This is the challenge. Seek the answer to that question. Why has God put you on this earth? Do this. Pray about it. And I would love to hear some of your answers as we go through the next week, month, and several years to find out why God has put you here. I believe that God has brought us all together to be his church right here in this community in the Ridley School District, in the Inneborough School District, right here in southern Delaware County, God is pulling together a body to do his work. Let's do that work. Let's do that work together. Mm -hmm.